So hello, welcome to week nine, where we're looking at visual cultures that emerge out of trade, an activity that contributed to the accumulation of wealth and the capacity to produce objects and the acquisition of such objects uh, in a world uh, where things are now prized for their static value and prestige that came along with it. So our story of trade, though ultimately will focus uh, from the 17th to the 19th century, uh, is also connected to an earlier historical trade network. And uh, just to set it into context, it wasn't really gold that shook the world, nor was it diamonds. The very thing that changed the world uh, irrevocably are spices. And these are things that you might have in your kitchen today. Uh, the image above shows you cloves, and these are principally uh, used for flavoring, uh, especially uh, when it's used uh, to create a nice scent for the wine, a chewing gum or perfume. Uh, the oil of cloves are also uh, uh, known to have antiseptic properties. Uh, it's also an ingredient used in soap, ointments, and drugs. The one below shows the nutmeg, and this is something that is created into a powder form. So you see how it looks like in its original shape that is round, uh, and then so it, it is created, it becomes a powdery, uh, like a, uh, a pile over there, and this is used uh, as principally as a flavoring in sweet, spicy dishes, fruitcakes, seafood sauce, and really it's uh, uh, something that is highly prized because these added so much more complex flavor to an otherwise really bland meal. So interestingly, uh, these two spices were originally found on the islands of Ternate, Tidore, and Batan in the Mulakas island in Indonesia. And uh, to say that uh, you need to cultivate them uh, is probably a misrepresentation for the nutmeg uh, plant itself. It doesn't take a lot of effort to grow. For the local Maluku sultans, all they had to do was to, uh, you know, take care of their turf, make sure that the nutmeg grow, collect them from the trees, take out the nuts and traded them for food, clothes and all the things they ever needed uh, from the Chinese, Malay, Arabs and Bugis spice traders. Uh, so clearly there was a lot of competition between the Muslim and Chinese over the control of the spice trade then. Uh, and uh, of course, these were then uh, these past hands uh, to perhaps the Arab traders who then controlled many of the trade uh, with Europe. So for the Europeans to obtain uh, these spices, uh, imagine that the spice had to change how many different hands. The map itself gives you an idea that these were traded across the sea and over land and traveling great distance to reach Europe itself. So because of this uh, great demand, um, and including the various taxes that were then imposed, you know, a pound of nutmeg in Europe uh, would cost uh, as much as seven fattened oxen, uh, and was even considered as a much more valuable commodity than gold. So what happened then? Uh, what resulted in the Europeans needing to leave the confines of their home if this was already an established pattern of trade for a very long time. We know this has at least stretched all the way back to the 8th or 9th century as we have discussed in our previous uh, lessons. And then there are also um, later records such as the Gazetteer of Foreign Lands which I'm um, inviting you to have a look is uh, it's a very rich 13th century ethnographic and geographical directory of nearly 16 foreign countries known to China uh, because of its maritime trade relationships, covering really an expanse that corresponds with the trade network that we have just described before. Uh, so if this was already an established pattern of trade, as much as it is a really complex one, 
then what gives? Why uh, were the Europeans needing to uh, find a different way to uh, obtain these spices? Uh, part of the reason was Europe wasn't being very smart when, uh, when it rode out under the Christian banner to fight against uh, the trading partners, the Arabs, uh, during the Crusades, uh, where uh, the Christian and Islamic armies, the conflict between these two armies resulted in the Arabs uh, cutting off the supply of spices to Europe. As such, there was a sudden need to respond to a growing demand locally. It was a business opportunity that required significant uh, model of investment and principally during the earliest phases uh, with the Iberian empires of Portugal and Spain, uh, uh, these investments came directly from the king's or the monarch's purse. Okay, uh, so let's see. As a result of this, of course, we know the story of how Columbus eventually ended up in America, discovering that there's this continent uh, between uh, Europe and Asia or India uh, as they, were, they thought they would end up in if they were to travel all the way westward. Uh, so it wasn't unknown that the world was round. It's just not known how far you had to travel before you can get to the other side of the world using the alternative route rather than go through the Cape of Good Hope uh, in Africa. During the first phase of Western expansion of power, the two principal actors were the Portuguese and the Spanish. Uh, and and uh, they both then uh, decided to uh, institute a policy and sought the, uh, the recognition of the Pope then uh, to recognize their sovereignty, not only on land territories, but actually across the sea. Uh, from this emerged the idea of the closed sea or the Mare Clausum. Uh, this was in many ways ratified uh, through uh, two treatises uh, where with the agreement and recognition coming from uh, the Pope who holds the highest office within the Catholic Church hierarchy. Under these agreements and treatises, other European powers were left out of the conversation and left out of the competition. Essentially, it divided the seas uh, and to two halves. One, uh, uh, one half belongs to the Portuguese uh, kingdom and the other half is for the Spanish kingdom to explore. So because the Portuguese uh, possess uh, the route that skirted around Africa uh, towards the Indian Ocean, this meant that this was closed off to any Spanish use. As a result, the Spanish had to find another way. And the alternative way was to figure out how they could cross the Pacific Ocean and eventually arrive at uh, what they imagined to be the other side of India. Uh, so, uh, you know, and uh, Magellan, uh, Ferdinand Magellan in 1519 participated in this expedition uh, that was successful in some ways. He himself uh, uh, unfortunately did not complete the, uh, the circumnavigation around the world because he was ultimately killed in the Philippines in 1521. Uh, and uh, then the, the expedition was then taken over by a, a Spanish navigator, uh, Juan Sebastian Elcano, that then ultimately led the sailors to the Molaka, the Spice Islands, or the Molaka Islands, ultimately uh, crossing the Indian Ocean safely and finally returning back to Spain. Uh, resulting in, therefore, the first circumnavigation of the world in 1522. And this, and this is why the expedition was known as the Magellan-Elgano uh, circumnavigation. And in many ways, this 
success is symbolic on so many levels of globalization and it is resonant this year specifically because we are commemorating uh, by next year the 500 years anniversary uh, of this circumnavigation. So when we look at the world this way, what do we then stand to lose? Uh, one thing is the more cosmological dimensions of map making then tends to fall on the wayside in preference for the accuracy in terms of how coordinates and geographical information are conveyed and represented through uh, uh, the European cartographic conventions. Uh, so for example, uh, he, if uh, we think of the tripum as a kind of the three world cosmological concept so much rooted in uh, Thai understanding of uh, geographical space, whether it's cosmological or physical, it is not as if uh, these were not expansive on their own terms or that the idea of the scale of the world was not communicated in any map making traditions of other cultures. After all, uh, often maps are more than just geographic representations. Uh, many of them take on cosmic significance as well, such as the Tripum map. So the word Tripum refers to the three worlds, uh, so it's the heavenly world, the earthly mortal world that we live in, as well as the underworld that structures and regulates a kind of interlink um, overlapping realities. Uh, so that even as we look at the map and see it referring to actual geographical spaces, they are in many ways not simply just that, they are also linked to other dimensions and realities uh, that then uh, allows the map to capture, capture information that they don't know only serve the purpose of, for, to guide one in terms of finding one's way in the world, but also guiding one in terms of finding one's way uh, on the spiritual sense of the word, uh, in the spiritual sense of the word. Uh, then uh, another example we can see is, uh, of course, in the Malay archipelago, there's very little map making tradition or, or very little has sort of survived and we know very little of uh, you know, the historical forms of map making, but there are five beginning sea charts that have survived, and uh, these date primarily to the 18th or most of them of the 19th century, and they give you a pretty good idea that the Bugis uh, were already drawing a lot from the European map making tradition, but in many ways, uh, turning it into a convention that they could really call on their own in its emphasis on the sea as this passage. Uh, notice how in the, uh, the map itself, there's very little attention being spared uh, to really uh, map or understand what is uh, in the hinterlands or, or what is land-based. Instead, uh, more important are the rock formations that one has to probably maneuver around as one who is sailing, uh, and therefore also uh, there, it is color-coded in the way that certain red islands then uh, were marked because they were uh, known as hiding grounds for pirates, uh, and then flags were also planted on specific uh, uh, coastlines to indicate that the presence of European rulers so even if we were to look at, uh, for example, Chinese map making tradition uh, and prior to uh, influences that came from uh, Jesuit missionaries uh, during the Qianlong court in the 18th century, uh, before that, the concept of uh, being under Tianxia is represented by this beautiful uh, blue color uh, map where what it entails is really uh, depicting not only a geographical space or what is known and, and, and centered on this idea that China really is the Middle Kingdom, it was at the center of um, everything, uh, but the concept of Tianxia also encompasses everything that is under the heaven. So even in a map such as uh, 
this the that try to capture all that is under the heavens is aspiration is universal it nevertheless pales in comparison to what is happening when with the with with the first second navigation around the world right uh, why do I sort of like think so? Uh, it's because I think in the circumnavigation, we now see the world reduce so much in scale or size. It is really an opportune moment for us to visit this topic, given that this year, or actually next year, um, this, uh, starting with this year, different countries are already celebrating the 500-year anniversary of this uh, circumnavigation. Uh, so uh, the fact that there are so many competing narratives that have emerged suggests to us that this is a historical moment, it's something that many people are still trying to make sense of, and part of this making sense is to challenge the prevailing Eurocentric account by exploring alternative narratives centered on other localities and centered on other non-European actors. One of them is uh, uh, the compelling one, not least because it concerns with our part of the world, uh, is in this figure called Enrique Balaka. So in his last will and testament, um, Ferdinand Magellan himself uh, described Enrique as a mulatto and a native of Malacca, part of Malaysia today. Altern alternately, uh, and there was also a competing account that uh, in, in uh, another uh, record uh, by Pigafetta, who actually completed the journey, which described uh, Enrique as someone who actually came from Sumatra. So there are two competing accounts. On the one hand, he's seen as a kind of hybrid figure, a mulatto, a creole, uh, or Branakan, uh, who came from Malacca, and it's not difficult to imagine Malacca as this cosmopolitan space where many of uh, the descendants were in fact Ranakan, or he could also be a migrant uh, resident uh, who came from Sumatra, uh, and therefore perhaps more Malay, uh, who somehow found, uh, wanted to explore his fortunes in a port city like Malacca. So uh, in Enrique himself, the, as it turns out, surviving records of this person uh, offers clues, perhaps, to a, a way in which we might not arrive at any certainty, but certainly it prompts us to ask uh, interesting questions uh, about uh, what we're trying to uh, really ask, or what are we trying to think about when we're trying to decide or figure out who is the first person who uh, first circumnavigate around the world is uh, what is the ideology behind or what is the agenda behind asking those questions and what do those questions ultimately serve. So in someone like uh, Enrique, he was acquired as a slave uh, during the fall of Malacca, probably uh, you know, at the early stages of the siege. Uh, so ultimately Magellan took him back uh, to Europe, uh, first to Portugal and then later he accompanied Magellan to Spain. It was recorded that Enrique ultimately mastered the Spanish language and so they were finally then given the green light to embark on the expedition in 1519. So as a result, according to many historians, there really uh, is the possibility that Enrique was the first person to have circumnavigated the globe, in a sense uh, claiming that Enrique uh, was such a person uh, really was piecing together two journeys that he had made. The first was his uh, 1511 uh, journey where he was captured in Malacca and brought to Portugal. And then second was his participation in the expedition sponsored by the Spanish crown that sailed across the Atlantic uh, to the Americas and then to the, through the Pacific Oceans all the way to Cebu in the Philippines. Uh, and this journey took from 1519 to 1521. Uh, however, the last historical record of Enrique was, located him in Cebu. And given that the distance between Cebu and Malacca is about 2,500 kilometers, uh, uh, this, uh, left him, you know, this was all that was left for him to complete the circumnavigation. And it was often assumed that he had completed it and he would, you know, finally 
return back to Malacca. So what I have offered you are two competing accounts of who might be the first person to have circumnavigated the entire world. Uh, in fact, um, um, in offering an alternative account, it's not so much to claim that it is more truthful or accurate compared to the first account. In any case, I think I hope it is moving you to consider why do we, why are we framing the question this way? And if so, what are we responding to? Are we responding to a history where uh, the dominant narrative have always position the European traveler or navigator as uh, the pioneering discoverer or the, uh, uh, in so much as the story of Enrique then offer a different perspective to help us to destabilize a lot of our assumptions. Uh, firstly, uh, not only because Enrique is someone that is clearly a non-European, but more importantly, that he is also a slave. And in thinking of slavery at the, as a central question, we are in many ways responding also to issues that continue to haunt uh, many of our discussion in the humanities today, uh, where there is a need to recognize uh, narratives of outsiders, of those who are marginalized, and think of creative ways in which their agency their, their presence in history could be recovered and how true this recovery it's not so much that we are arriving at truth we're arriving at a much more fuller and enriched picture of a very complex world where another perspective can really show us a different side of uh, this past that we assume that we already know